Um, so to give you some uh, just very brief background, I'm one of the original founders of what is now, or developers of what is now known as modern monetary theory. And we started this project in, there was just a couple of us, in the early 1990s. Uh, last week I was in New York and there were 400 people at a conference. So uh, We used to joke that we could count the MMTers on one hand and now there's 400 at a conference, and in London on Friday, I, there were several hundred also. Uh, and I've been doing th this tour this time in Europe. Uh, I've been meeting people in Portugal, Lis uh, Ireland, uh, France, Britain, and uh, th the awareness of our work is uh, growing. And one of the uh, sticking points, the remaining... Uh, issues that uh, uh, pe people who are coming to the ideas for the first time, one of the sticking points is the balance of payments. And so um, thanks very much to Heiner and Paul and uh, to invite me to talk about that here and uh, it's lovely to see so apparently you're called macroscopes so it's wonderful to see so many macroscopes in the audience. Um, the, the first slide here just gives you some fundamentals of what MMT is in case you haven't embraced it or come in contact with it yet. And so the, a, a starting point of many could be this one here, that the uh, fundamental, there, there is a fundamental difference in a monetary economy between the currency issuer and the currency user. And uh, mainstream macroeconomics tends to conflate those two as if there's no difference. And we, uh, students are taught around the world that uh, uh, the government is, uh, the currency issuing government is like a big household and is subject to the same financial constraints as us as households are. So we either have to earn, earn go to work and get income uh, we have to, to spend, uh, or we have to deplete our prior savings, or we have to uh, sell assets, or we have to borrow in order to spend. And um, a currency issuing government, like almost all governments, is not constrained financially in any way. Now, I exclude the 19 member states of the Eurozone, because all of your governments use a foreign currency. And that's a fundamental difference between a sovereign country and a non-sovereign country. None of the 19 member states are sovereign in their own currency. And um, the second point, what, what that means then is that a currency issuing government can always buy whatever is for sale in its own currency without question and that includes all idle labour. And so the implication, that the, the political implication of that reality, that's unquestionable. The political implication is that if you've got mass unemployment, then that's a political choice, not a financial constraint. And then, the, the, but, the, but the, uh, the political debate is all about, oh, we haven't got enough money to, to do anything about the mass unemployment. And the real question should be, why are you tolerating, in a political sense, the unemployment? Because you can do something about it. The um, fourth point here, central bank in a sovereign country sets its own interest rate. And the markets... The private financial markets do not set the interest rate. And one of the implications then of that is that a currency issuing government, and, and, and I put the central bank and the treasury, I mean in Europe you call them finance ministries, but and it depends which country you're in, but the, the treasury function, the fiscal function, spending and taxation, and the central bank, I put them together as the government. Because effectively, even though the 
neoliberal era has tried to pretend that the central banks are independent and they've put structures in place to make it look as though they're independent, every morning at 10 o'clock, the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Federal Treasury have very deep discussions to ensure that the central bank knows what the implications of the fiscal policy of that day is going to be for the impact upon bank reserves. And uh, if it didn't do that, the central bank wouldn't know how to intervene on that day to manage the liquidity in the system, which means that it would possibly lose control of its interest rate setting, which is its monetary policy expression. So the, the Treasury and the Central Bank every day are talking and coordinating. They're not independent in any sensible way. At a political level, they might pretend to be independent, but that's, that's the sort of ideological statements. And what that means is that in a currency-issuing monetary system, where the government is sovereign in the way I've des described it, the government can always set the yields on its bonds, always. And so this myth that the bond markets will hold a government to uh, hold a government hostage if it doesn't set fiscal policy and monetary policy to suit the needs of capital, and it will hold it hostage by pushing up yields and rendering debt impossible for the government to, to finance and, and uh, sustain, that's, that's a myth. A, a government can always set the bond yields at whatever rate they want, including zero if they want. And if you want a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, case study, study Japan. Japan has huge deficits in a relative sense. It has the world's largest gross public debt, even though its net debt is very considerably lower. It has virtually, it fights disinflation, not inflation, and its uh, long-term interest rates are, are very low, sometimes negative. And I know senior officials in the Bank of Japan, they've been my friends for years, and I know exactly how the Bank of Japan works in an operational sense, not a political sense. We're talking about the, the people that actually run the liquidity system. They can, set, they can keep the interest rate at low forever. And just look at quantitative easing around the world, Japan, Federal Reserve, ECB even, in this, in this environment, uh, Bank of uh, England. They all control the yields when they want to. So the only time you would get a, a bond yield rising rapidly is because the government has allowed that to happen. And then the, the other corollary of understanding all of that, the other implication, is that the government that issues its own currency doesn't need to borrow at all anyway. Why would it borrow? And uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but basically then borrowing becomes corporate welfare. We had a situation in Australia at the end of the 1990s. The federal government was conservative, had been running fiscal surpluses and uh, not, not rolling over debt as it matured. And who do you think the bond markets became very thin? In other words, there wasn't much, being, there wasn't much volume to be traded anymore. Who do you think complained? The investment bankers. And they demanded that the federal... There was an inquiry, which I was a, an expert witness at. I was completely disregarded, but that's another matter. And the government agreed, even though it was committed to running increasing fiscal surpluses, it agreed to continue to issue a substantial billions of dollars of debt every auction. Why would they be doing that if the debt was funding the government spending? They did it because it provided a risk-free asset to the financial markets to price their risky derivatives off and also to be a safe haven when there was uncertainty. And the, the last couple of points there is that when we talk about, fis when MMT talks about fiscal space, and I'll come to this in more detail in a moment, it's got nothing to do with the financial ratios. You know, the IMF produces these elaborate documents there 
defining who can expand their fiscal position and who can't, and they're all defined in terms of ratios of debt to GDP or to the size of the deficit to GDP. That's meaningless for a currency issuing government, absolutely meaningless. The fiscal space that's available to a government that issues its own currency is, is the available real resources that are for sale in that currency. That's what the fiscal space is. And so if you've got mass unemployment, you've got lots of fiscal space. If you've got everything productively being used, then you've got very little fiscal space. And the only way you can create fiscal space in that second situation where you've got full, everything's working hard, is to increase taxes, to deprive the non-government sector of some of the real resources. That's what taxation does. Taxation doesn't fund the spending. It deprives us as private spenders of the capacity to spend to create idle resources which the currency government can then bring into productive use to fulfil its social programs. That's a brief introduction to MMT. Right, we've got to get this. This, uh, oh, look, this was, used to be a beautiful blue. See, I like blue. And someone in Macroscope has made it a dirty brown. <laughs> and I really hate it. Uh, this is, an, uh, this is uh, easier to understand than it looks. Uh, down on this uh, axis, we've got the... Below the, vertical, below the horizontal axis here, we've got fiscal deficits, government spending more than taxing, and above we've got fiscal surpluses, government spending more than taxes. On this axis, we've got uh, the current account position, the external balance, and so out beyond this line out here, we've got current account surpluses, and uh, in, in, so that way is deficits and this way are surpluses. Okay? And so take a position C here and this, is an, this exploits the macro framework called the sectoral balances which is derived from national income accounts. And it's a very shorthand way of understanding the relationship between the, the sectors. So we've got the three sectors, government sector, private domestic sector and the external sector and they spend and receive income. And so therefore the financial balances that result from those activities can be summarised in this type of diagram. And so if you take point C, we know that is a point where the uh, external balance is in deficit and we also know that point C is where you've got a fiscal deficit. But because they're, uh, they're equal and offsetting, that must be where the private sector is in balance at zero. And I could do the same thing for point A up there. So anywhere along that 45 degree line is a private domestic balance where they're spending exactly what they're earning. And so therefore anywhere inside the dirty brown section, uh, is a private domestic surplus. And so you can get here, a this, this triangle here is a private sector uh, surplus but an external deficit and a, and, uh, sorry, and a government deficit. And so p areas, uh, this funny geometric shape, up to the top A and then down again <coughs> to here, that funny shape there. That's a, that's a private domestic surplus. So the net, the private sector is saving overall and it's a combination of different types of balances for the other sectors. So the reason that we, that we think in this way is because in the long term, the private domestic uh, sector can't be in uh, deficit for, on a continuous basis forever. Because what that implies is it's going to be accumulating increasing amounts of debt and because it's spending more than its income on an ongoing basis, 
so anywhere above that 45 degree line. And it can do that for a short term, but eventually the debt levels become so high and, and the, they become so sensitive to small changes in, in economic parameters that you, you then get a... Uh, they, people cut consumption spending or private invest, uh, firms cut investment to try to improve their balance sheets. And that's, that's sort of global financial crisis. That's what happened. And so the sustainable area, long run for an economy, is the brown area. And what that means then is that for a country that's running an ex external deficit, then you're, you're really talking about this triangle here. That triangle there which means that if you want to be the private domestic sector to have a sustainable long-term position and your country's running an external deficit, then you have to be running a fiscal deficit on a continuous basis. And for countries that are running um, current account surpluses, well, then they've got more f space out here. Now then, briefly, an application, if you put a fiscal rule in, and that's the 3% Eurozone Stability and Growth pack, uh, Pact rule, well then look what, for, for a deficit country, external deficit country, look what happens to your available space. It shrinks from that to that. Not much flexibility there. OK, so moving on quickly. The question then is, well, how does the external sector limit the fiscal space that a country has? Because uh, if you're not worried about the external sector, you've got much more space to, for, for a government to use its fiscal policy. But if you believe that there's a balance of payments constraint on fiscal policy, then you've got much less space. And what are the issues? Uh, the issues are inflation risk, uh, depreciation from uh, inflation from depreciation, uh, speculation, currency speculation, uh, uh, higher interest rates and bond yields. These are the sort of issues that people think you've got a current balance of payments constraint. Uh, for me, more importantly, the problems of deindustrialisation where your manufacturing sector disappears and moves abroad. That's much more concern for me than these other things, as you'll see. Uh, and so those are the main arguments that are used to, to justify the claim that there's a balance of payments constraint, that, yeah, that fiscal policy uh, can't, has to uh, address. The uh, next slide talks about fixed exchange rates. And the old view used to be that uh, fixed exchange rates were the source of stability. And what this tells you is that, and I'm getting a, a time signal, so I'm moving quickly, is that there is no stability in uh, fixed exchange rates. They did present a, a, a st this, this stop-go uh, constraint because if, as soon as you, you expanded growth and pushed out imports, you put downward pressure on your exchange rate. The exchange rate was fixed by agreement uh, whether it was a sub-agreement like in Europe, Europe in the time or Bretton Woods was a bigger world agreement and that forced you then to s stop again. You went, could go for a while and then you had to stop. That was the real meaning of a balance of payments constraint. And uh, uh, it, it, it created in, in external deficit countries a recession bias. And ultimately, it was politically unstable. You couldn't, you know, France couldn't continue to 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 operate effectively in a in a, or Britain was a good example in a uh, fixed exchange rate regime. What what flexible exchange rates did for those who adopted them Prince after August 1971, a little bit later because there were attempts to revive Bretton Woods, but only a couple of years, was that for the first time in a long time, the central bank had the capacity to set its own interest rate. 
and fiscal policy no longer had to be sympathetic, that is, passive, to the monetary policy. And that was that recession bias I talked about. And so you could allow your external imbalances, and I don't even use the word imbalance to describe a current account deficit, but you could allow the exchange rate to mediate those imbalances and use your fiscal policy and monetary policy tools to pursue domestic objectives like full employment. Now I'm just going to uh, skip a few things here. That's it. Now, uh, under flexible exchange rates, that stop-go constraint, which was the way in which the balance of payments constrained a fixed exchange rate system under Bretton Woods, that's no longer applicable. And so the, 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 the main arguments are that a flexible exchange rate is regime is vulnerable to imported inflation because of depreciation. Now, that's true. Uh, uh, and the depreciation and the imported inflation can negate the real benefits from any fiscal stimulus in domestic economy. That's true too. And uh, what does it depend upon? Well, it depends upon, first of all, what we call pass-through, how, how, how strongly the exchange rate passes through into import prices, and, and then it depends upon how important import prices are to the domestic price measures. And the evidence is that the pass-through effects tend to be very slow. They tend to be relatively weak in most countries. And uh, they, uh, there, there is obviously evidence of some imported inflation, but it's, it's not significant in most countries. And it's, not, uh, uh, it, it's relatively finite. I, this, I won't have time to do this graph in detail, this table. I come from a small open economy and we have swings in our exchange rate from 50 cents US to $1 US within a matter of a couple of years. We're among the, you know, we're the second or third wealthiest country in the world. Our exchange, we, we don't export com uh, industrial goods, we export primary commodities which have terms of trades doing that. And when the exchange rate, you know, these two examples, when the exchange rate fell 36% and then it went up 48% in a five year period. Massive swings, yet we hardly notice it. The, the, top, the, the, the high income earners uh, notice it because imported BMW motor vehicles become more expensive. So what? And trips to uh, Swiss Alps for ski holidays become more expensive. The rest of it, don't, us don't go on ski trips to Swiss Alps, we go camping up the coast on the beach. We hardly notice it. And sure, we complain, oh, you know, iPhones are now more expensive, and then a couple of years later we're saying, God, the iPhones are cheap. The, 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 this, this slide here talks... I've got one more minute, so we, we've got to round it up. Um, this slide show, this slide here talks about currency speculation. The, the bottom line is that under a fixed exchange rate system, the costs of defending the peg were huge in real terms relative to what happens under a flexible exchange rate system. And if, if things get really disastrous, you, a, a, a currency issuing government that's in charge of its legislature can always introduce currency controls. Now look at Iceland. It's a small little volcanic rock. It had the biggest banking crash in history. And it's tied up the two, two very large American hedge funds, tied their funds up in Iceland by imposing capital controls. There's been legal battles trying to... The hedge funds have been trying to get the government to, to, to release the money. They've lost. It tells you that a sovereign government with legislative capacity and sovereignty can, is, the, is in charge. It's the boss. And I talk here about the widow maker, and you can ask me about that in question. It's about Japan's 10-year bond trade. The last points I'd make, I just want to make sure I get things that are important in the last 30 seconds, is that... <clears throat> 
having, having your own currency doesn't mean you'll be a well-off. A country only can be as well-off as the resources, real resources that, can, that, it can, that it has or that it can trade. And so there are situations where there's, and I, I, I do work in developing economies, where these countries have got nothing that not anybody wants for sale, for exports, and they're food dependent or they're energy dependent. Well, well, having currency sovereignty isn't going to help that. All it can do is bring what resources, meagre resources that country has, they can bring them always into full productive use. And that's a role for... And, and what, what MMT has argued is that that presents a role for a multilateral institution. And so the IMF really should be helping those countries, not hindering them. And the last point I'd make relates to uh, industrial deindustrialisation, and uh, th there's no doubt that a country that's running chronic external deficits, and by the way, Australia runs external deficits of about four percent of GDP, and it's been doing it for 50 years. And we live we live very well because we can persuade foreigners to put this sort of stuff on ships and send it to us and all they want back is some bits of paper, some financial claims in Australian dollars. <coughs> Live it up while you can. It doesn't mean that they might suddenly not want our financial assets, but while, while they want them and are willing to give up real resources to do it, then we, we party and have a good time. But that's not to say that that can't shift very quickly and when you do have those sort of uh, shifts in preference for your financial assets, it's painful, no doubt about it. But it doesn't happen very often. And what, what normally is the case is, why do, people, why do foreigners want to accumulate your financial assets? Because you've got stable government, because you've got a well-defined contractual and legal system where there's certainty, because you've got skilled and well-educated labour and you've got diversified investment opportunities in your economy. Unlikely, I mean, if, if, the, if, if the balance of payments crisis story was true, Australian dollar should be at rock bottom and, and nobody would buy our financial assets. It's just not true. And, but there is a problem of deindustrialisation and if you lose your manufacturing sector and, of course, that requires a structure in place to to make sure the winners and the losers in Martin's sense uh, it's done equitably and justly. That's the last point I'd make. Thank you.